thank everybody for coming out to the gospel tonight. We trust God is speaking, but we would emphasize to you, if you're not saved, that you might make it a priority. It becomes so easy. I know that. I know that as a believer. It becomes so easy to sit under the gospel as if it's just something we do. But there's souls in the balance, and your soul may be one of them tonight. You do not want to play fast and loose with God. God is gracious. God is long-suffering. God is not willing that any should perish. But there's not one of us, there's not one of us that knows what the next minute holds. So we trust tonight that you might become earnest about your need if you're not saved. Now, before we open the word of God, let us bow our heads and we'll ask the Lord for blessing. Our God and Father, we thank thee for the grace of God that has appeared unto all men. We think of our Lord Jesus Christ and we wonder at his coming. We thank our God of how he could state that they that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs on my head. And we thank our God of how those were his enemies wrongfully are mighty. And then I restored that which I took not away. We wonder at his person, the beauties, the excellencies, the multifaceted glories of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a path it is that we can trace when we look at him in thy word and our hearts are gripped and won and taken up with the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's none like him and there never will be. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in flesh. We thank thee for the purpose of his coming and his purpose of taking on humanity that he might pay sin's judgment. He might pay for sin, which he never committed. He could never sin. In him is no sin. And yet he died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried. And he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. We pray that someone tonight, they may receive from thy hand the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, and they may do so according to the scripture. So we commit the results to thee. We understand, my brother Eric and I, we come to the understanding our complete inability to stir an anxious thought in the hearts of those here tonight. And so we would leave what we cannot do into thy gracious care, and we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that he might be honored and glorified as he would be presented tonight, we ask in his name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to turn to a few passages, please. Job chapter 33. I was not going to look at this, but how can you not look at a passage like this in light of what we'll consider tonight? Job chapter 33, please. <clears throat> the book of Job. And chapter 33, verse 14, for God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men and his slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. He is chastened also with pain upon his bed and the multitude of his bones with strong pain so that his life abhorreth bread and his soul dainty meat. His flesh is consumed away that it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not seen stick out. Yea, his soul draweth near unto the grave, and his life to the destroyers. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand to show man his, that is God's, 
uprightness. Then he is gracious unto him and saith, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable uh, unto him. And he shall see his face with joy, for he will render unto man his righteousness. He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. John chapter 3, please. John chapter 3. Again, very well-known verse. It's been preached, I think, every night. I haven't been keeping a tally, but I believe it's been preached every night. It's been mentioned at the very least. John chapter 3 and verse 16, please. Words of our Lord Jesus when he was here in this world. Speaking to Nicodemus, a religious man, leveled his religion. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Because God's salvation is not obtained by religion, but through a relationship. So John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have ever lasting life. One more chapter, Revelation chapter 20, please. The book of Revelation and chapter 20. I don't usually read what comes before, but I just want to look at verse 10 so you get an understanding of how solemn this is. The devil that deceived them, verse 10, the devil that, re- that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Notice that, where they are. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God will bless. He has promised to bless the reading and the proclamation of his word. You will have noticed I have lowered the tone of my voice because what we have read tonight is so solemn, exceedingly solemn. It has been presented many ways and in many times in a very callous way. And sometimes perhaps has done damage to the cause of the purpose of who was presenting it. Can I say tonight, my brother and Eric tonight, I know he would agree with me, we do not in any way enjoy presenting a passage like this tonight. But there's at least a couple of reasons why we do. Number one reason is because we have to be honest with God. We have to be faithful to him. God has given this in his word. 
The Lord Jesus, time and time again, warned of wrath to come. And if we don't preach it, we're not being faithful to God. But the second reason is, we seek to be true to you tonight as a listener. If there's somebody that's not saved tonight, that you may leave this meeting and we say, oh God, help them to understand. Help them to get a glimpse of what is to come if they're to die in their sins. The Lord Jesus said, if you die in your sins, whither I go, you cannot come. And this is the final judgment of the wicked dead. Now I know Christendom in many places, they try to present a general judgment as if all men stand before one judgment. But friend, can I tell you that the word of God gives us at least a few. If we were to read in the earlier chapters of this book, and if we were to look back in Matthew chapter 25, particularly, we have a judgment of living nations. We have the Savior coming to the world and dealing with the nations and lining them up and setting aside those on his left, the goats, those on his right, the sheep. But this is a future time, and this has to deal with living nations. What we are dealing here with is not living. We read those words, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. This judgment does not take place on earth. I want to think of a few things concerning what we have read in Revelation chapter 20. And I want to think, first of all, of the judge that we have read about upon the throne. There can be no doubt who this is that the word of God would present as the judge upon the throne. In John chapter 5 and verse 22, you remember the Lord Jesus said, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. The one whose face was battered and bruised and marred more than any man, but a face full of tender mercy and compassion. But here in this judgment, we see that so terrible is the face of infinite righteousness that the heaven and the earth flee away from the presence of him who is of pure eyes and to behold evil, and he cannot look upon iniquity. The judge who was once the savior, now he's judge. I want to think of the throne. We read those words. I saw a great white throne. Great because of the majesty of the judge who sits upon it, and because of his infinite power, and because of the eternal consequences of the judgments involved in the decisions which are given on this throne. White because of account of purity and holiness and perfect righteousness of all judgments. No mercy shown here. Dear friend in the meeting tonight, understand there will be no mercy shown at this judgment. If we were to read in chapters previous, we would see that there's a rainbow. Where the, where the throne is, there's a rainbow signifying God's promises. But here, friend, there's no rainbow because it's just infinite, inflexible righteousness. There can be no appeal from this court, for its verdicts are final. There is a finality in the judgments of this throne. Who are the accused? The accused are the dead. I mentioned there'll be no living person standing at this judgment as in Matthew 25, when the Lord Jesus comes to this world and his feet touch the Mount of Olives, there'll be no living person at this judgment, for we have read that it is the dead, the dead to be judged there. The eternal power of God will assemble the dead. We read in this account that the graves of all who died without Christ throughout all history will be yielded up they will yield up the bodies and death and hell will give up the souls of the wretched inmates and soul and body will be united to stand.
before that great white throne and will stand before the merciless gaze of a righteous judge. They've spurned his offer of grace. They had God's revelation. Romans chapter 1 tells us creation gives us a full revelation as far as the fact of God's creation. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that all are without excuse. But then there are those who have conscience and who have understood that I, there's something's wrong, and when I have done wrong, it's as if an alarm is gone to tell me I violated my conscience. But even greater than that, God has delivered his word. Tonight, friend, in the meeting tonight, you're hearing the gospel. Every time you hear the gospel, it deepens the guilt. And every time you hear the gospel preached, my friend, you're throwing fuel upon a fire. They have spurned his offer of grace, and now they must account for the crimes. Who are the accusers? We read that the accusers are the open books. You know, one of the most solemn things is that heaven keeps a written record of all the deeds of men and women and boys and girls in this world, the, deed, the lives they've lived, the deeds they have committed, the thoughts that they have stand irrevocable in the books. Every detail is held to account in the divine record, but man is also writing his own memory. And when a man or a woman stands before this judge, their memory will tally perfect with what is written in the books. Memory alone would condemn, but God has a written record, and it will agree with the written record, and they will stand with their mouths stopped. You know, I was thinking of Sergeant Russell Williams, CFRB Trenton in Belleville, near Belleville, uh, Trenton, Ontario, near Belleville, Ontario. He was the highest ranking officer in that place. In the morning, he would go to a, child, a children's hockey game and he would drop the ceremonial puck. But in the evening, he was committing heinous crimes and harming people from the community, women from the community. The police began to close in on him. And they put him in an interrogation room and they sat and interrogated. And they said to him, they had asked him questions. He thought he was going to play a game of cat and mouse and he would outsmart them. But then one of the officers, he put down two pieces of paper upon the table. One was a photo of a tire track. The other was the print of a boot. And he said, it's game over. These match your boots and they match the tire tracks of your, of your uh, Ford Escape. It's game over. But you know what happened? He thought that he would erase the, the photos that he had upon his laptop. He had heinous photos of the crimes that he committed. And he thought when he knew the police were closing in, he would erase the hard drive and he would be in the clear. But what took place was this. The officer said, we have collected the hard drive of your computer and we've sent it to California to a forensic investigator. He thought he erased the evidence. They said, oh no. They said, we have every photo that you tried to erase. You see, friend, when men and women stand at that great white throne, every article of evidence will be there to see. The book of life is also opened. Uh, the roll book of the saved who are in, the Christ, uh, in Christ. It must be open. There are many who have lived honest lives, who die in a misguided belief that they somehow have fulfilled all the virtues of righteousness, somehow have lived a life that's good enough. You know how many people I've spoken to? And they say, I'll take my chances. Friend, there's not a man or woman in this world that stands a chance if they get to that great white throne. Exalted in their morality, but godless. You see what do you mean by that? 
exalted in their morality. They think I'm a good person. I go to church. I've been baptized, part of the role of the church. What they don't understand is they're without Christ. And they stand in their sins guilty before God. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And though God is not answerable to man, yet he is so careful even to vindicate, even in their eyes, the righteousness of all his judicial acts. What I mean by that for the children is this. God is careful enough to go precept by precept, line by line. Because even though, even though he's not bound to it, he is careful to show that all of his acts as a judge are righteous. The verdict. What's the verdict at this throne that we see here at the great white throne? The incomprehensible proof of the guilt of those stands written in the books, their works exposed, and as a conclusive demonstration, their names are not found in the book of life. He'll open up the book of life, and he'll say, your name is not in the book of life. Thus, every mouth will be stopped, and all will confess that he who sits upon the throne is justified in his dealings, and clear when he judges. We read that they were judged every man according to their works for the basis of their judgment. Understand, nobody, nobody can be justified. No one can be right with God on the basis of their works. But this judgment isn't about whether they're good or, or not. They're already found guilty. They are now being judged for the crimes that they have committed against a holy and a righteous God. The measure of punishment will be adjusted according to their works. You say, on what basis do you make a statement like that? Can I just quote a verse from the Lord Jesus? And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell for if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, they would have remained until this day. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. And we read those words, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Friend, can I just highlight this solemnly? In the second death, death will keep its meaning. Absolute separation of soul and body from God in total seclusion from the source of all light and life. The second death will consist of unending judgment in a lake of fire. Can I say this tonight with a few minutes left? The truth of the gospel is you will never be delivered from this judgment if your sins are not removed. You can never be in God's heaven, friend, in the present moment as you are with one sin in the record of heaven before you. In our green hymn book that we were singing from, there's an old Irish hymn, and listen to what the old Irish hymn says. Hell is fire forever burning. Turn, poor sinner, turn and flee. Mercy waits at thy returning with a pardon full and free. Can I speak for one moment as we have left on the heart of our God? We read those words, and I want to tell you tonight, friend, thank God we can tell you of a resource for deliverance. There's deliverance tonight from judgment, and that deliverance comes from God himself. We read those words in John 3 and 16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And when God's son came and went to Calvary, friend, he took the fiery judgment of God. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for us, the unjust that he might bring us to God. Friend, can I tell you there was one who felt the fiery judgment of God Almighty from heaven above. 
And I want to say tonight that all the prayers you may pray to God will never save you. It could never deliver you from going down to the pit. All of the tears that might flow would never and cannot ever deliver you. They would never even add one iota to your deliverance. All your brokenness of heart, all your anguish, and a million other things notwithstanding cannot and will not deliver you. But bless God, friend, there's a God who can. Listen to the response as I close. We read in Job chapter 33, He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not, then he is gracious unto him, and saith, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. You see, friend, when someone comes to God and recognizes the fact that I am a sinner, and I have sinned, and my sin is against a holy God, and I have no defense, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Then he is gracious unto him and saith, deliver him. My, wouldn't it be something tonight if there's a young boy that could hear from God's word, deliver him from going down to the pit. Perhaps a girl not saved under the judgment of God, awaiting judgment for sin, and they cry out, oh God, I've sinned. Can I tell you, friend, there is a God who longs to deliver you. And it's not based on your tears. And it's not based on your anguish. And it's not based, friend, notwithstanding on a thousand other things that you could ever muster up. It is based upon the precious blood of Christ that was given at the cross. And he cried that triumphant cry, it is finished. And he bowed his head and dismissed his spirit. Kind men took him down and buried him. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And tonight, friend, if you were to receive him, you'll be delivered from every sin. Can I implore you tonight? And I will leave you with the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, receive him tonight, and you'll receive the deliverance from your sins. Now, before I speak, I'll speak to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we appreciate the message from the Bible. God is faithful in warning, and he has warned us even tonight. And as we, myself, opened the word of God and speak, that we might speak to souls that have been warned of the fire already, and that they might flee and come to the only one that can rescue and deliver. It's very solemn. It's a very solemn thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But, Father, people don't have to fall into the hands of a living God to be judged. They can come to Christ, and if any man come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Bless thy word tonight as we give thee thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Now, I'm just going to read where our brother read. I'm going to go backwards. I've never done this before, but I'm going to go backwards in my thinking. I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 20 because that's where I had meant to stop. And I'll just read it to you. Our brother has already vividly and clearly given you that vision, that vision of the throne and of the judgment of God. And I'm going to read it to you because that's where I was going to stop, but I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to go backwards on what I wanted to speak about. But just listen now very carefully to verse 11 to verse 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Think about these words. 
And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of these things which were written in the books according to their works. And I saw the sea give up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man or every person, according to their works. And death and hell was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's the vision. That's the vision that God wants you to get. He wants you to stop and understand that this is important from his word and you need to get a little look at the throne and at the man that sits up on the throne. John chapter 19. Think about the vision. John chapter 19. This is the victory, not the vision, the victory. John chapter 19 and verse number 28, is it? John 19, verse number 30, I want. I'll just read 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, gave up the ghost. The throne is the vision. The tree is the victory. The victory. You don't have to go to the throne and be judged. Not at all. Why? Because the man that sits up on the throne that will judge you is the same one that is nailed up on the tree that will forgive you. And that's what we want to speak a little about. And I'll one uh, two other readings, and one is found in 1 Peter chapter 1. And you'll understand why I read this one too. 1 Peter and chapter 1. And we'll read verse 18 and 19. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from the vain conversation received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. To the tree is victory. That's right, victory. When it comes to here, it's the value, the value of the precious blood of Christ. The value of Christ never loses its value, not at all. At the power of Christ has never lost anything. It's all in the precious blood. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. The victory, the value. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, last verse. And some of the children memorized this verse for Sunday school, if I understand right. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation. Ready, it's worthy to be accepted by all. Everybody can receive it. It's worthy of doing that. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, whom I am chief. Watch this. This is a venture. A venture that couldn't, it definitely couldn't fail. It couldn't fail. There are many ventures that man has made. Many. Humanity has made many ventures. The English Channel, a tunnel under the English Channel. Tremendous. They started on one side and started on the other, went down under the ground and met solid. Not an inch off, they tell us. Not at all. But, you know, they could have failed. They could, they, they could have made a misjudgment. Uh, you know, the, the railway across, uh, across Canada, they, you know, in them days when they were started to build the railway, they said it could never go to the Rocky Mountains. Impossible. No, no way of ever getting through. But it did. It did. They did it. You know, the bridge crossing from Prince Edward Island to New Brunswick. Uh, a lot of people thought it could never be done, you know. 
But the engineers got together, and it was done. It was a moment when it was, when it was done. But they could have failed. They could have failed. You know, there's uh, uh, the, the, the DNA, the study of, of people and the DNA breakthrough is tremendous. But they could have failed not to find it. God didn't have to tell them. God didn't have to give them the brains to find it out at all, but he did. He allowed them just to show how great God really is. Study of the human body, you should know it. Great things. But you know, uh, the man that stood on the moon, first man that stood on the moon. A lot of people still don't believe that they put the man on the moon. Uh, the man on the moon, and as he stood there, he says, uh, the greatest step of humanity isn't that man is standing on the moon. The greatest step of humanity is when Jesus Christ left the splendors of heaven and became human flesh and came down to earth. What did our verse say? This is a faithful saying. This is a true saying. And a lot of people don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God either or God himself. A lot of people in our world don't believe that. But it's right just the same. It doesn't change because people don't believe it. Because people don't believe they were on the moon, it doesn't, doesn't change that they were on the moon. And because people don't believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came down to earth, doesn't mean anything. He still did it. This is a true saying. And it's worthy to be accepted by all. If you're going to miss the judgment at the throne, you've got to come here. You'll never appreciate the mansion if you never appreciate the manger. If you never understand who was in the manger and who Mary had in, his ar in her arms and cradled in that manger that day, if you never learn that he is the son of the living God, that he is God himself manifest in human flesh, then you will never appreciate the throne. You will be at the throne, but you will be there to be judged. You will be there to be judged. Every single person that stands at the throne, they're only there to be judged. You heard the story. A young man who's studying to be in law, studying to be a lawyer. And in his study, one day, he's, uh, you know, down at the traffic, and it was the day of the horses and buggies. And, and uh, you know, the horse and buggy was coming into town pretty fast. And a little boy was running across the street. And, and he was in danger of being run over by the horse and the buggy. But the young lawyer ran as fast as he could. Snatched the little boy and drew it away from the horse and buggy and saved his life. Wow. But, you know, both of them grew. The young lawyer developed and went into law and became a judge. And the young man that was saved from dying in the street that day developed too. But he went into criminal activity and got into trouble. And one day he found himself in the law and he found himself standing and he was being judged. And the same man that sat upon the seat to be his judge was the same man that saved him from the horse and buggy. Listen, the Lord Jesus that came from heaven for one purpose, my friend. That's what he says here. Christ Jesus came into the world. He came for one purpose, one purpose alone. He came down here to a world of sinners. He came down here to rescue us and to deliver us out of the danger. Our brother made it so clear and vivid. I hope you got a vision of where you're going and where you're going to be and what's going to happen. But you know, you don't have to travel that broad road. You don't have to continue here. You don't have to go through death all alone. Death is reality. 
I stood on the 17th floor of General Hospital, city of Montreal, and I said before here, you know, with my brother a day before his 19th birthday, and he's slipping into eternity. Whatever you do, Ronnie, this is your last moment. Whatever you do, don't go out into eternity without settling the great account that you have with your God. Please, whatever you do, you don't have to go to death all alone. Why? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ the Lord, came into the world to save sinners. Any sinners here? Any sinners here? That's who he came to save. He came to save sinners. He came as an adventure. That's right, a venture that he couldn't fail in. Step by step, moment by moment, the plan of God unfolded as he drew near day by day until there was that moment when he was led outside the city walls of Jerusalem carrying his own cross, he went forth, and when they came to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. That's why he came. I don't know how I'm going to die. I know it's a possibility that I might die. I might die before I get back home. I don't know how I'm going to die. But this man, Jesus Christ, knew exactly. As a boy of 12, he's in the temple with Joseph and Mary. And he stays behind. He goes on and he stays behind. And he's questioning the, the rabbis in his day. And Mary and Joseph come back and finds him. And this is what Jesus said. Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business. He came to rescue us. Will you let him rescue you? That's the mission tonight. We spoke about the, the giving of the son the other night. He gave his son. We spoke about he gave his servant. That's why he, I'm sure our brother, yeah, we wouldn't be here in, in Manitoba, not now, if it wasn't for him. I, I, I was astounded. I, I was praying and asking the Lord what to do and to telephone. No, I got a text, Brother Tim. And there it is. I'm going to Manitoba. That's right. The Lord picked us up and sent us over here, and we're here for you. That's the reason. A servant sent to present Jesus Christ as the one who came from heaven, that there would be that moment outside the city walls of Jerusalem when his lovely hands, hands that never did anything wrong, could never do nothing wrong. When in lovely feet and hands was nailed upon the cross. That's why he came. He came for that moment. Shadrach and Meshach, Meshach and Abednego, isn't that? They went into the fiery furnace but never felt the fire. That's right. Uh, when it comes to Abraham and Isaac, Abraham and Isaac went to the mountain. And, uh, you know, Isaac saw the fire and he heard the fire. But he never felt the fire. There was a substitute for Isaac. But, ah, oh, the Lord Jesus Christ felt the fire. You and I will never understand what it was for the holy spotless Lamb of God to be nailed upon a cross, and in the darkness, God laid upon him all of our sins. Were your sins laid upon him? Where's your sins tonight? Where are they? He came as a venture. What a venture. But in John chapter 19, that venture led him to the cross. And what a victory. The Roman Empire, with all their power, could never touch his life. Understand that. All the, all the 
power of the Roman Empire, no matter how much power they had. They had power to destroy the temple and to beat down Jerusalem and to destroy Jerusalem and to do a lot to Jerusalem and to kill the Jewish people and to do a lot to the Jewish people. But they couldn't touch him. You know the only reason why they nail his hand and feet up on the cross? Because he allowed them. That's love. That's real love. He loved them, and that love was going to come down over 2,000 years, 2022. Right down to our day. We are still feeling the effects of the victory of Calvary. It is finished. It is finished. Oh, they scourged them. They crowned him. They spit upon him. They plucked the hair from off his cheek. But he, in the darkness, did the work that no one else could do. In the darkness, with a broken body, a body that was, you know, as visage is so marred more than any man and more than the sons of men. That's the body that was nailed up on the cross. And that's the body that God laid upon him, our iniquities. For he loved me and gave himself for me. He loved me and gave himself for me. Preached in Nova Scotia one night. And there was a girl in the meeting. She had two black eyes. Her partner had given her two black eyes. You ever have a partner like that? She listened to the gospel. Yeah, she was brought up into a Christian home. She knew the truth of Calvary. She knew the truth of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. She'd been brought up as a child, right from her father's knee as a child. He, she was taught who Jesus Christ was and what the Lord Jesus Christ did upon the cross. But she listened to the enemy and took her pathway in the sin. And the pathway in sin led to drugs and led to immorality and led to two black eyes. And she sat in the meeting that night. I saw her weeping as she listened to the gospel. And I quoted a number of times and preached for, you know, that God loved me and gave himself for me. Himself for me. And when she went out of the meeting, she says, Mr. Fowler, I know I heard the gospel a lot of times, but I never knew before that it was for me. It was for me. I love that hymn, 213, in the green book too. It was for me, for me alone. The Savior left his glorious throne. The dazzling splendors of the sky. Was it for me he came to die? March 11, 69, yesterday. 53 years ago, 10 minutes before 11. I understood for the first time it was for me. That's love. That's real love. And God showed the world that what Jesus said up on the cross, it is finished, really was finished. When that body was taken down and wrapped in the cloth and put into the tomb. And the stone was rolled there as though he was never come out. And you know, he did. He did come out. He, he didn't, uh, you know, I didn't roll away the stone, I had somebody to roll away the stone to get out. No, he came out before the stone was ever rolled away. Me think he came out and watched the stone roll away and says, they'll see it when they come that I'm not here. He is not here. He is risen. That's the victory of Calvary. That's the real victory of the message of Calvary. It's the man of Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Do you want to know him? Is there a boy or a girl and you've been troubled in these meetings? God has been speaking to you. You know that this is your day. This is your meetings. You've been already telling the Lord, I want to be saved. I would like to think tonight that there's not only one, but there's a number of boys and girls. You listen so well. Thank God for your Christian home.
Thank God for parents and grandparents who pray for you and want you to have the greatest thing that you could ever have. But in order for you to be able to have that, there had to be a battle fought. No battle like the battle at Calvary when the holy spotless Lamb of God became sin for us and he bore our sins in his own body upon the tree. No battle like that battle. And it was for me. Can it say it was for you? Can you sing that lovely hymn? If you can't sing it now, may you be able to sing it before the night is over. It was for me, yes, all for me. What a victory. What a venture. What value. Things go up and down. They tell me now that some of the things they got to buy in the Ukraine is four times the amount of what it was before. Oh, they can get certain things, but they got to pay more for it. And you know, you don't know. The oil prices goes up and the gas prices goes down and, and the dollar rises and the dollar falls and all the rest of it. And you know, you run and try to get a ticket. It, you almost got to gamble, go gambling to get a ticket to fly anywhere. It goes up and down so much. A lot of things change Ah, uh, the value of the precious blood of Christ never changes. The Lord Jesus could tear, turn to the thief and say, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Why? There was power in the precious blood of Christ. God could reassure him from his own words. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I will, because he said that. The, Lord, the thief on the cross says, remember me. When thou comest into thy kingdom. Remember, ha, have, have you prayed since you come in here? Remember me, Lord, tonight in the meeting. Uh, I'm just a little boy. I'm just a little girl here. Uh, I, I love to be saved. I want to be saved. I know the Lord could come, and I don't want to be left behind. I, I, I don't want to stand all alone before this great white throne and the Lord Jesus up on the throne. I don't want to stand here. I, I want to be ready. I want to be cleansed by the blood of Christ. I want to be saved tonight. And you can be. Our brother gives you the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, any whosoever's here, on this side, any whosoever's, in the center, any whosoever's, on the right, is there any whosoever's? Whosoever believeth in me should not perish. I will never be here standing all alone at this great white throne and the man sitting on the throne was the man that was nailed to the tree. The boy that was judged by that judge that day, he said to the young boy, he says, I know who you are. He says, you were the boy that I rescued. I was your savior. I rescued you from dying when you was a little boy on the street. But you took your own way. You sinned against the law. You sinned against the, the, the country. You sinned against God. And now I'm your judge. And I am so sorry. But I must judge you for what you have done. Mm. There's a man that died today. I told you the other night. I put the open air tent right in front of his house. Open air trailer with Steve Joyce to preach the gospel to him because I had an exercise for him and him alone. He grew up in the Christian home too and his father was one of the most godliest men in Parsons Pond. But he took his way. I, I, I don't know, I don't know, I've never got the news yet truly. I don't know where he is tonight, but if he died like he lived, he's not in heaven. If you die like you're living, like you are right now, you're going to be in heaven. You don't have to be at the throne for judgment. For the Lord Jesus took the judgment for you. He felt the fire. The fire of the wrath of Almighty God. The fire of the judgment burned into his soul. My God, my God. We read it this morning. Why hast thou forsaken me? He was forsaken. That you and I would not be forsaken. The victory at Calvary, and you can be saved tonight.